Hello and welcome to the History of Modern Greece. I'm your host, Daniel Roberts, and I'm here with my father, George, and our theme music is brought to you by Mark Youngerman. This is a podcast that covers the events from the fall of ancient Greece to the modern day. This is episode 38, Charlemagne. Where we last left off, Charles Martel had saved the West, and his name would live forever. But at this point in the narrative, he was not king. Charles Martel was the mayor of the palace, which meant he did all the work of the king, but he was not the king. In 734, the Arabs sailed north along the European coast from Spain to Marseille, but Charles Martel reacted swiftly and rode night and day with his cavalry, cutting down the Arabs at the Battle of Arles in 734. This was a decisive Christian victory against the Islamic Empire. Charles chased the Arabs back through the countryside, slaying their men along the way. In 737, King Theodoric, the Merovingian king, died, and his role was so unimportant that he wasn't even replaced for several years. Now, a few years later, in 741, Charles Martel died. And strangely, in this same year, Pope Gregory III, Charles Martel's greatest ally, also died, leaving Charles Martel's two sons in charge, Carloman and Pepin. These two princes were educated in Paris and were taught from the clergy personally. These two princes were bred to be leaders. Pepin was given the western provinces to rule over, and Carloman was given the eastern provinces. In 743, a new Merovingian king was finally crowned. After the seat lay vacant for many, many years, without anyone even caring. And this king's name was Childeric III. He was nothing important and had no real power. In 746, Carloman was in the middle of a bloody war with a neighboring tribe of Alumani in the east. And during the fight, he called for a meeting between the two tribes so they could pursue peace. It was very normal. But in a very deceitful move, he had his guests from the warring tribe murdered in his own house. This act was considered so treacherous and deceitful that the church condemned the act and Carloman himself. The church demanded that Carloman pay for his sins by humbling himself before the Lord. Carloman complied with the reprimand of the church, proving his loyalty to the faith and stripped himself of his belongings and traveled to Rome on a pilgrimage. After traveling over the Alps, poor and destitute, Carloman kneeled before Pope Zacharias and was stripped of all his titles and made into a monk, where he was officially inducted into the monastery. Now this was a major precedent set in Europe, Carloman was the first most powerful man in the Western world, and he gave up all of his rights and titles because the Pope ordered him to do so. Carloman was the first king to have more invested in his spiritual being than in his royal powers. In 747, Pepin assumed the role and title of his brother, uniting the kingdom under a single ruler. But again, only as the mayor of the palace, under King Childeric III. Upon taking his role, Pepin swore an oath to the Pope, binding the fate of France to the faith of the Catholic Church forever. Pepin swore that France would forever be the defender of the Pope in Rome. In 751, Pope Zacharias deposed the last Merovingian king, Childeric III, and cited that the Merovingians no longer acted like kings and were therefore no longer worthy of the title. The title of the king was then bestowed upon the mayors of the palace, the Carolingians, 
for they were the true rulers and protectors of the land. Pepin was elected king and then appointed by the bishops and then the pope. There was now a fierce enemy on the doorstep of the Christian kingdom, and the pope wanted the Carolingians in charge when the Arabs invaded next. King Pepin is also known to history as Pepin the Short. He was the first Carolingian king of all Francia, and you'd think that his family would have been proud of him. But of course there were members of his family who strongly opposed his elevation to king. His son Drogo was jealous and wanted the crown for himself. And so Drogo led a rebellion against his father. Pepin quickly put down the rebellion and captured his traitor son Drogo. After cutting Drogo's hair, which was a great shame in Frankish culture, Pepin forced his son into the monastery where he spent the rest of his life. Pepin then marched his army over the Alps and into Lombardy, capturing several cities. The Romans lost these particular cities to the Lombards many years before, and they felt they should have them back. So the Romans sent a representative to the Frankish king, Pepin, and ordered the cities be returned to the Byzantine Empire to whom they rightfully belonged. But there was no way Pepin was going to give away these cities to the Romans, so he donated them to the papacy. It not only helped the papacy become more autonomous from the Eastern Church, but it also strengthened the relationship between the Franks and the Pope. At this point in time, the papacy and the Franks had grown almost codependent. The Franks used the Pope for legitimacy, and the papacy used the Franks as protection against the other Germanic kingdoms in Europe, specifically the Lombards. Pepin then moved his heavy cavalry into Aquitaine and chased the last of the Arabs out of France, containing them behind the Pyrenees Mountains in modern-day Spain. In his life, he built up the Francia Kingdom, secured his borders, and grew into an international power that was strong enough to hold off both the Caliphate and the Eastern Roman Empire. Pepin is easily one of the greatest kings of the early medieval period. What made his reign so successful was the fact that he didn't have to split the kingdom with a handful of bloodthirsty siblings. Now that the Merovingians were gone, it was time for the Carolingians to do away with Frankish customs and not make the same mistake as the previous line of kings. In 768, Pepin died, and in traditional Frankish custom, he divided his kingdom up amongst his two sons. The only reason this didn't immediately tear the kingdom apart was the fact that there were only two sons. But still, it was the same terrible mistake made by all of the Frankish kings who had come this way before. In 770, Charles, the eldest son of Pepin, reached out to his adversary, the Lombards, and made an alliance with their king. Charles agreed to marry the Lombardian princess, strengthening his ties with one of the largest Germanic kingdoms in Europe. This move would ultimately surround his brother Carloman and put pressure on him. However, this completely betrayed his father's relationship with the papacy, and in a desperate move, the Pope threatened to excommunicate Charles if he didn't call off his wedding to the Lombardian princess. Charles did not want to be excommunicated, as that would destroy his legitimacy and allow his brother Carloman to claim the entire Frankish kingdom for himself. Somehow, whether through charm or wit, Charles convinced the Pope to allow the marriage to continue in exchange for more Lombard land to be ceded to the papacy, turning Vatican City into Vatican Kingdom almost overnight. Suddenly the Pope was cool with the marriage, and Charles married the Lombardian princess. And now that his lineage and alliances were all set in place, it was time for Charles to go to war with his brother. In 771, Carloman made preparations for war with his brother Charles. He was staying in his villa when he came down with a terrible nosebleed. This nosebleed was very bad too, as he bled so much that he collapsed onto the ground where he quickly died. There was an immediate investigation into the cause of his death, and the conclusion was drawn. He died of a nosebleed, a very natural nosebleed, definitely not suspicious at all. With Carloman now dead, Charles immediately inherited his kingdom and became the king of all of Francia. Charles was now in charge. Instead of the nobles rallying behind Carloman's sons, they praised Charles as their new king. 
Now, Charles was only 29, and he had many years to focus his army outside of Francia. His first act as king was to go to war with every single tribe outside of his kingdom. His cavalry rode into villages and small cities, and he conquered by the sword. His army was unstoppable, and one by one, the smaller Germanic tribes were assimilated into his kingdom. And as he conquered, he forced all of them to convert to Catholicism and renounce their Arian faith. In 772, Charles invaded Saxony. The Saxons were divided into four distinct groups, with Eastphalia in the east, Westphalia in the west, in the center was Engria, and in the north was Nordalbingia. He focused his army on the center and rolled into Angria, massacring entire villages and forcing everyone to convert to the Catholic faith. Because the Saxons were still pagans, he brutally executed anyone caught worshipping the old gods. Now a fun fact, the Saxons worshipped a god named Woden, which is where we get the name Wednesday, literally translating into Woden's Day. While Charles was brutally subjugating the Saxons, a new pope came to power and instantly started trouble with the Lombards. The new pope demanded the Lombards return several cities that had been conquered in the past. This demand negated the treaty, brokered between Pepin and the Lombards, and in return the Lombards not only ignored the pope's request, but also seized several more cities. This was a direct violation of the treaty and an attack against Charles' greatest ally. Even though the king of the Lombards was technically his father-in-law, Charles was not going to let him get away with this. He was forced to cut short his campaign in Saxony and ride to the aid of the Pope, but not before divorcing his wife, the Lombard princess. In 773, Charles' army marched across the Alps. The Lombards controlled the passes and knew the mountains very well. Charles split his army in two and led them through different passes. Charles personally led the smaller group through the pass and caught the attention of the Lombards. The king came to the mountains to face off against the Frankish army. While the Franks battled the Lombards in the mountains, the second much larger group of knights made it through the eastern pass, completely undetected, and snuck up behind the Lombardian army. Word made it back to the Lombardian king that a second and much larger army was attacking them from the rear and was about to overtake them. The Lombardian king fled the battlefield and made haste for their capital. The city walls were impenetrable, and the Franks would never broken through without siege weapons. But the Lombards were not prepared, and they did not have enough supplies to wait out the siege. In 774, Charles seized the capital of the Lombards, taking the crown from the king and merging it with his own. Charles was now king of the Franks and king of the Lombards. He was now Charles the Great, or some knew him as Charles Magnus, but most knew him as Charlemagne. In 775, Charlemagne returned to Saxony to finish Christianizing the pagans. His cavalry focused on Westphalia this time, and they rode in with speed and deadly force. They cut down the Saxon warriors and annexed their capital city, but the Saxons were warriors and they put up a good fight. Unfortunately, the Saxons were no match for Charlemagne, and the small tribes and villages were subdued or set on fire. Anyone caught worshipping the old gods was killed on sight. There were so many pockets of resistance popping up in the countryside, and Charlemagne was having trouble riding from one rebellion to the next. What made matters worse was that all of the Catholic missionaries were being killed by the pagans. In 776, Several Lombard dukes rebelled against the Carolingians in, the, in northern Italy. Charlemagne reacted instantly, as he was always traveling with cavalry, and he galloped across the Alps and into northern Italy, crushing the rebellions. And Charlemagne left his two sons in charge of different kingdoms, in hopes that this would groom them for leadership. Already, Charlemagne was planning on making the same mistake every Frankish king had made before. And with the winter coming in, it was now too cold to campaign in Saxony. So Charlemagne returned to his capital in Francia. In 777, Charlemagne met with his court to discuss what to do with the Saxons. It was time to come up with a plan. 
How were they going to absorb them into the Carolingian Empire? It was while they were discussing Saxony that several men came to visit Charlemagne's court and present him with many gifts. These men were from the Umayyad Caliphate in Spain. There were representatives from four different kingdoms, Barcelona, Girona, Huesca, and Zaragoza, all with a message for Charles. They informed Charles that the Umayyad Caliph had been overthrown in the east, and a new Abbasid Caliphate had taken over. The surviving Umayyad family fled to Spain, where they established their new emirate, and the messengers told Charlemagne that the Umayyads were not welcome there, and the original kingdom set up by the first Arab conquerors wanted the Umayyads gone. The emir was taking over all of the small kingdoms one by one, slowly taking control over the entire Iberian Peninsula. The leaders of these kingdoms invited Charlemagne into Spain to help them defeat the Umayyad emir. In 778, Charlemagne led his army into Spain and sent two divisions across the Pyrenees Mountains, one across the Northern Pass and the second to cross the Southern Pass to the city-state of Barcelona. His two armies penetrated the mountains and then met up at the first major city on the other side, Zaragoza. And when the Frankish army made it to the city gates of Zaragoza, the Arab prince came out to welcome them and got one good look at the army of barbarians and had a sudden change of heart. He barred the gates and forbade them entry. The Franks laid siege to the city of Zaragoza, and as we all know, sieges take a long time. And while Charlemagne was laying siege to the castle at Zaragoza, word traveled across the Pyrenees that the Saxons had risen up and were raiding the countryside. Now Charlemagne couldn't afford to let the Saxons run rampant in his kingdom, so he gathered up his army and retreated up along the southern side of the Pyrenees until they made it to the small town of Pamplona. Now this was the last city before the northern pass through the Pyrenees. And Charlemagne feared the Arabs would use it as a base to launch an invasion into France. So he had it pillaged and tore down the city walls. Charlemagne's forces were passing the mountain city of Roncesvalles when his rear guard came under attack. The narrow and wooded passage through the mountains had his entire rear army cut off from the rest of his forces. And while most of his army made it out of the mountain passage, the last line of his army was surrounded and cut off from the rest. These men fought to the very last. Many nobles, including Charlemagne's nephew Roland, were lost in this ambush. And the treasury wagon was captured. This ambush occurred on August 15, 778, and was the only defeat in all of Charlemagne's career. After Charlemagne left the Iberian Peninsula, Emir of Cordoba moved his armies north and conquered the kingdoms of Zaragoza, Huesca, Barcelona, and Girona, executing the leaders who conspired against him. Now these kingdoms in the north were hard to control, and the Umayyads eventually lost some of the land to the Franks, including the city of Barcelona. Now the Franks eventually took control of all four kingdoms, and established a puppet state called the Spanish March. And these four kingdoms, on the Muslim side of the Pyrenees, were a buffer zone on one of the most dangerous frontiers in Europe. In 779, Charlemagne returned to Saxony, this time raiding from Westphalia to Eastphalia. Pillaging and murdering as he went, he crushed any and all resistance. The people who survived the initial bloody fight were round up and given a choice. Convert to Christianity or lose their heads. Every winter the Franks left Saxony, and every winter the Saxons rose up in open revolt, usually by killing all the Catholic priests. But not this time. This time when Charlemagne left, the Saxons stayed quiet. In 781, Irene and Charlemagne arranged a marriage between Constantine VI and Charlemagne's second daughter, Rotrude. This was a perfect opportunity to strengthen his ties with the Eastern Roman Empire, making his kingdom even more powerful and influential. In 782, a new Saxon warlord seized power. He was an open pagan, 
and renounced the Catholic faith imposed upon them from Charlemagne. Of course, this triggered Charlemagne to ride north with his cavalry. The new religious laws imposed upon the pagans were too extreme, death being the punishment for practicing any form of paganism. Things got so bad that the Pope urged Charlemagne to spread Catholicism with missionary work and not with the sword. But Charlemagne did not listen. It is said that Charlemagne ordered the execution of over 4,000 Saxon prisoners by beheading just to send a message to the people. This, of course, ensured more bloody rebellions. In 785, the Saxon rebel leader surrendered to Charlemagne. He converted to Christianity and eventually became a Saxon noble under Charlemagne. The Saxons had officially been assimilated into the Carolingian Empire. There were a few small revolts here and there that lasted into the beginning of the 9th century, but they were minor and quickly subdued. The Saxon campaigns were the longest lasting in all of Charlemagne's reign. In 787, Irene, the empress in Constantinople, ended the marriage to young Rotrude and this angered Charlemagne. As retaliation for the open humiliation, he personally led a campaign into southern Italy and annexed several cities from the Byzantines. This marriage could have possibly united the Eastern and Western Roman Empires. In 788, a war with the Eastern Germanic tribes brought the Franks into direct contact with the Avars, a very wealthy kingdom that descended from the Eurasian steppe hundreds of years before. And almost immediately after meeting this new group of people, Charlemagne declared war with them. His cavalry rode into the kingdom of the Avars, and his mighty superior forces annihilated their army. The Avars were now a settled people, and had many fortresses that took years to conquer. In 792, another Saxon revolt popped up, and Charlemagne was quick to gallop across the kingdom from one battlefield to another. He quickly crushed the Saxon rebellion, and by this time, the Saxon Christians were so sick of pagan uprisings that they joined forces with the Franks and defeated the rebellion. In 796, Charlemagne's forces were finally able to take the fortresses in the Avar kingdom and completely annexed their entire territory. Now at this point, Charlemagne was unstoppable and he pushed his way east, conquering the Slavs and even pushing south into Croatia and Dalmatia. He was getting very close to the borders of the Byzantine Empire. And ever since Irene cancelled the marriage between his daughter and her son, he was bent on taking everything from the Empress. Unfortunately for Charlemagne, the campaigns into Croatia were not successful, and he was unable to take that kingdom. In 799, the Pope came to Charlemagne for help. It turns out the Roman citizens had risen up and forced Pope Leo III out of the Vatican. The mob dragged the Pope and tried to burn his eyes out and use hot pincers to tear his tongue out by its roots. Luckily for Pope Leo, he was able to escape the mob and fled to Charlemagne where he pleaded for help. And Charlemagne agreed to help the Pope take his rightful place in the Vatican City so long as the Pope swore an oath of innocence to him. So Charlemagne marched his army south and used his heavy cavalry to force Leo back into office. The Frankish knights rode through the Papal States and slaughtered everyone who rose up against the Pope. Charlemagne and his army spent the winter in Rome, fortifying the Papal States with Frankish knights. In 800, on Christmas Day, Charlemagne attended Mass and knelt at the altar to pray. While Charlemagne was kneeling, Pope Leo III placed the imperial crown upon his head, crowning Charles as Roman Emperor in the West. This was the first time there had been an emperor in the West since the fall of the empire in 476, over 300 years before. This act was a direct challenge to the Eastern Roman Emperor's claim to the imperial throne. Because he was crowned emperor in the West and not of the West, it implied that he was the emperor of the Eastern Roman Empire as well. This also set a second and more destructive precedent. The Pope had the authority to crown the Emperor. 
and if he could crown an emperor, then surely he could uncrown one. To this day, scholars dispute whether or not Charlemagne wanted to be crowned this way. That if Charles had known about the crowning beforehand, he would have refused. Others think they were in collaboration together since the start. The fact that there was a jewel-encrusted crown sitting by the altar suggests Charlemagne knew all along that he was going to be crowned emperor and donned the purple. Charlemagne was a fighter. His entire reign was fought fighting on some frontier of his kingdom. It is said that his royal court was on horseback. He didn't need to be in the capital to meet with foreign dignitaries, as he was always in royal session. But Charlemagne's rule wasn't all bloodshed. Even though that was a large part of it, he wanted to bring education to his empire. He wanted to build something bigger than himself that could rival the Roman Empire in the East. To quote Dr. Ryan M. Reeves, the Carolinian Renaissance was a real thing. Charlemagne wanted scholars to come to Aachen, his capital, so that his kingdom could flourish. They studied the Bible, but also codified laws and established real legal precedents that established the Carolinian law to something comparable to the laws created by the Roman Empire. If there is one thing a society needs to flourish, it is rule and law. This is directly observable by looking at the cursive scripts that came from this period. If you look at all of the Roman cursive texts written by the Franks up till this point, they are damn near impossible to read. But as soon as you get to the scripts written in Charlemagne's time, suddenly there is a font that is readable and presentable. It looks like a font that might be created by a typewriter or a computer. This font is called Carolinian Minuscule, and it was a universal font used in the empire. Charlemagne's imperial palace was in Aachen, on the border of modern-day Belgium, and it is in this palace that the birth of the Carolinian Renaissance really takes place. Charlemagne was obsessed with learning and education and tried to learn writing himself, but it was just too hard for him to get used to but it showed that he had a passion to take on everything educational. His palace in Akon was built to rival those in Byzantium. One of the towers in the palace at Akon was dedicated to holding ancient texts and scrolls. Because of Charlemagne's dedication to education, over 7,000 manuscripts from the 9th century survive today. We owe him big. These Roman scrolls could have easily gone the way of the Alexandrian library. And if you were a scholar during this time period and needed to get your hands on a copy of a specific text, you could bet all your shillings that you would find it in this tower. These palaces also housed an elephant. An elephant! Given to him as a gift by the Caliph of Baghdad. This elephant was very dear to Charlemagne and was brought on many campaigns. And we know this for a fact because there is a record of this elephant dying well on one of those campaigns. Just think about that. A French army in northern Europe during what is like the coldest time period in Europe in thousands of years. And the French king is riding a war elephant into battle. Well, not personally, of course. There were also natural hot springs that heated baths all year round. These baths were originally constructed by the Romans, of course, but Charlemagne did restore them. Charlemagne enacted religious reforms while in office as well. He snuffed out Arianism from Northern Europe and made everyone follow the Nicene faith of the Catholic Church and subsequently the Byzantine Empire. He also made it mandatory for all churches to collect their tithe, which is a flat 10% tax from every citizen. Now this system centralized the tax system in the Carolinian Empire, and he made sure that his clergy were highly educated with the sermons so that every church from one corner of his empire to the other practiced a uniform version of the faith. No European ruler would go on to rule more land in Europe than Charlemagne for a thousand years until the age of Napoleon. And when Charlemagne died in 814, his original plan to split the empire between his three sons 
was already off the table, as he only had one surviving child when he passed away. Young Louis became the sole emperor of the Carolinian Empire. Louis would eventually divide the empire up among his sons, and not all by his own choosing. His sons started a civil war amongst themselves when Louis remarried and had a new kid. It ended up with the complete breakup of the Carolinian Empire. One son went to rule over France, the other ruled over Germany, and one brother ruled over Burgundy, a border country between France and Germany which no longer exists. And Aquitaine was never fully settled and remained a separate kingdom from France until 860. When Charlemagne died, he did not originally bequeath the title of Roman Emperor to his son. Nor was he ever the Holy Roman Emperor. Some people like to call him the first Holy Roman Emperor, but it is later on in the 10th century when the grandchild of Louis the German claimed this crown and the title of the Holy Roman Emperor for the Germans, which would remain in German hands until the 19th century. Well, that's it for today. Join us next time on the history of modern Greece. Stay safe and stay awesome.